Well, welcome again today. It's still winter time in South Africa. It's very cold and wet today, but we're glad that you're able to join us as we turn again to God's Word. So a very warm welcome to you. And particularly so if you have not joined us before, but you've decided to join us today, we are glad to have you. We're studying the book of Genesis, and we've come to the portion of Genesis where he talks about the flood of Noah. Noah and the flood. I'm sure you've heard the story, but we're coming to the end of that now, and we're going to talk about Noah's flood today and some of the outcomes of it all. So I'm going to read to you a few verses from Genesis chapter 9, and I'm reading from verse 18, Genesis chapter 9. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of, of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his younger son had done to him. He said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servant shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the God, the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Now, we've already covered quite a lot of the book of Genesis. We've covered in our discussion something about the Long Ages, that these early um, uh, characters in Genesis seem to enjoy. And we've also covered the terrible wickedness that came upon the earth and God's um, anger with the wickedness that came upon the earth and God's judgment, which came in the form of a flood, but how Noah was a righteous man amongst all of the wickedness, and God had made a covenant with Noah, he had an agreement with Noah, he had accepted Noah as part of his people, and he instructed Noah to build an ark, that box-like ship thing that we're used to seeing, and how the flood came and Noah and his family went into the ark and God shut the door and how they were saved. We also have read how they came out of the ark and how Noah offered sacrifices and how God blessed Noah and his family and entered into a covenant with them. But today we come to a very unedifying part of the story and uh, nevertheless it is part of what happened and we have to cover it in all truth and in all integrity. So I'm calling this section today Blessing and Buffeting and it covers the sections of chapter 9 uh, verses 18 to 29 of the book of Genesis. And the first thing I want to point out to you is that there comes a time after they'd been out of the ark and begun to till the land again and Noah had had, had planted some vineyards, there comes a time when Noah drank of his own produce and he became drunk. Now Noah was a righteous man and he walked before the Lord, yet anybody can make a mistake and anybody can fall. And Noah fell. Noah should not have got drunk. We all know today, all of you listening to me today, you, 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 you can't, you can't be an educated person today and not know that binge drinking is bad for you. In fact, drinking is bad for you if done to excess. And so Noah 
must have gone on a binge of some sort because he's just flaked out in his tent. And there he lay, naked, uncovered, in an absolute drunken stupor in his tent. A very, very undignified and a very sad picture of a man who had a covenant with God. And let's be frank about this so that, so that we can be prepared for the future. It is possible for even people who have a relationship with God to make mistakes. Sometimes when somebody who is a Christian or a pastor or somebody in a church position makes a mistake, and makes a mistake of some sort, we all throw our hands up in horror as if, as if they're not human and they shouldn't make mistakes. But people, everybody can make a mistake. Of course, mistakes should be paid for in some way. But you know, God doesn't throw us out because we make mistakes. In our case today, we know from our New Testament that the only reason why God will bar us from heaven is if we reject the Lord Jesus Christ. But here we have God's servant, who is the beginning of a new humanity after the flood, which covered the whole earth. Here we have him lying in a drunken stupor in a most undignified situation indeed. Now the story goes on. I'm just relating the story to you because it's the narrative and I'm just telling the story. The story goes on to say uh, he was discovered by his son Ham. Ham goes into the tent and he sees his father naked. Now, instead of covering his father up, Ham goes out and tells his two brothers what he saw. His two brothers immediately take a cloak, or a cloak it says, must have been a blanket or cloak of some sort, and they carry it and walk in backwards to the tent until they see their father's feet and then they drop the cloak over him so that they do not see him naked, undignified and exposed. They behave in a completely different way to Ham. They behave with deference, they behave with respect and they recognize this is something that should not be and something their eyes should not behold and so they cover their father up. Now, when their father eventually came to his senses, when he had sobered up, he was very angry with Ham. You know, sometimes people who are drunk know very well who does what to them. They can't always sometimes remember everything, but sometimes they can. And it's something to remember, especially in our day and age, when we read so much about what happens in certain circles today. Sometimes young girls are drugged, or made drunk and then they're abused and sometimes it's true people won't believe them the courts won't believe them because they were under the influence but you know people under the influence can sometimes remember more or less what happened to them although they can't remember all the details and so Noah remembers knows that his son Ham did something to him and so it says when Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him. Now, it seems like there may have been something more than just looking at his father that took place between Ham and his father. But we don't know. We don't know enough about it to be dogmatic about it. But that's what the language implies. He knew what his youngest son had done to him. And we recognize immediately that Noah knew something that we don't know. And so he pronounces a curse upon Ham. Now, before I come to that, let me just make a comment about drinking and wine. As I've said before on these programs, the Bible does not condemn anybody for drinking wine. In fact, wine is mentioned often in the Bible. It's even included in some of the sacrifices in the temple where some of the sacrifices are accompanied by libations of wine. That means wine is poured out. Wine is a sign of cheer and happiness and life and prosperity. And it's poured out before the Lord to recognize that he gives us everything that he gives us. And even the Lord Jesus, as we know, turned water into wine for a wedding. So we 
are not amongst those who condemn wine on every single occasion, although we do recommend that Christians, especially those who are in positions of authority, be very careful with wine and abstain if they possibly can. But on the other hand, the Bible has a tremendous amount to say about wine that far surpasses all of the other references. There are numerous references about wine and drunkenness and wine and foolishness and wine and stupidity. And all you have to do is take it up, take up a concordance. I have a lot of Bible verses here in my notes, but I'm not going to read them now. They'll take too long. And all I'm saying to you is if you can find a good Bible concordance or even Google, you can, you can find the verses that recommend us to stay clear of wine if we can. However, having made that aside, we come back to the story of Noah and Ham and his sons. And we read that Noah's blunder resulted in something that needed to be done to somehow correct this blunder. And so he had to deal with his son, Ham. And Ham's actions, which were full of disrespect and um, voyeurism, at least, if nothing else, um, warranted that some kind of punishment or some kind of some kind of discipline was exercised upon him, and so the this chapter nine, which concludes the story of the flood, ends with these two statements from Noah. First of all, he says, "Cursed be Canaan." Who's Canaan? Canaan is the son of Ham who looked upon him. Canaan is the son of Ham. And so Noah says, Curse be your progeny. Curse be your family. Curse be those who come from you and your family. Curse be the whole line that comes from you, Ham. Because a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He will be the lowest of the low. You will never achieve what his brothers achieve. And he and his brothers will always be at loggerheads with each other. He will be a servant to them. They will increase, but he will decrease. And they will make their lives good, but his life will be a bad life. And so curse, the curse will rest upon you, Ham, and upon your children. And so he uses the word Canaan, which is Ham's son, and he uses that as a kind of a title, a rubric for the whole of, of Ham's progeny, reaching out into the future. They will be cursed and they will be servants of servants, the lowest of the low, if you like. And uh, that is a very, 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 very serious curse to receive from Noah, who is in a relationship with God, notwithstanding the awful picture which we have just discussed about him. He's still, he's still God's man to start a new humanity. I think that we should be encouraged by that, that we can still be used by God, still be God's people, even though we make mistakes. Uh, sometimes there'll be a blemish and a scar, and sometimes we can't do the things we used to do. But nevertheless, God doesn't discard us because we make mistakes. But when it comes to deliberate, perverted sin, then we've got to deal with a holy God who has a different way of dealing with us. And so Ham's action resulted in the fact that his whole family line was cursed for all of his posterity because he acted in an unfilial way. And so how sad all of that is for us to know today. However, having done that, then Noah says this. He says, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, now, you would have thought that you would have said, Blessed be Shem, whose God is the Lord. No, he doesn't. He says, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. So, why does Noah say that? Because it's a doxology, do you see? He's blessing the Lord that Shem and Japheth did not enter into the sin. Blessed be your name, Lord that you've preserved me and my family and that you haven't wiped us all out. One of them has fallen. 
but blessed be your name, Lord, that not all have committed the same sin. So blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan, here we come back to Ham and his family line again, let Canaan be his servant. Now in those days when these men pronounced a curse, when God's men, God's representatives pronounced a curse, the curse was usually carried out. It was them speaking for God. It was them indicating what God's purposes with these people will be. And then he says, And may God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. Now Japheth, you remember, helped Shem to carry the cloak and to cover his father. And so Japheth and Shem together are blessed by God. And God remembers that when he blesses Shem. Shem is going to be the main son from which the line is going to come, from which, which is drawn right down to all humanity, the line on the one side of the people, who worship God and love him and the line on the other and the line which indicates the other side of the people who will be enemies of God. But Japheth isn't forgotten. For those who help people to do good things and godly things are not forgotten. And so may God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem. Shem will be your protector. You, you will be blessed and you'll dwell with Shem and Shem will be your leader and your protector all your life. And then he adds this. And let Canaan be his servant. So Canaan's going to be the servant of both Shem and Canaan's going to be the servant of Japheth as well. Now it's a very sad story, this. It really is in many ways because as you read in chapter 10 of, um, of Genesis, you'll read that Ham eventually gave rise to the line of people we've come to know as the Egyptians. And he also gave rise to the line of people that we know who become uh, the people of Cush, who are usually recognized as people along the African coastlines. And he gave rise to the peoples who are called Put. I'm not too sure where Put uh, uh, is placed geographically, but these are the three lines where uh, that, that emerge from Ham. And upon these lines, there is an enmity toward God. And we remember, of course, uh, after the Israelites were formed, they were put and they were taken into Egypt, and Egypt put them into slavery. We remember that. That's just an indication of how the enmity of God rolls on down through the centuries. And so these are the people of Ham. And these are the people of Shem and Japheth. On the one hand, you've got people who are forever cursed to be the enemies of Almighty God. On the other hand, you've got people who will forever be blessed by God. Now, that does not mean to say that the people who are blessed by God can't sin in such a way that they can no longer be God's people. And nor does it mean that the people who have been cursed by God can't repent and be incorporated into the people of God. In fact, when we come to the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, there were many people who were his enemies, many people who were, who were from the tribes of his enemies, many of them related and interrelated with other tribes and perhaps even with Ham himself, who nevertheless put their faith and their trust in Jesus. You see, no one needs to be left out of heaven and no one needs to stop coming or cease coming to the Lord Jesus Christ or hesitate to come to him because it doesn't matter who you are or where you come from or what your lineage is or, or what your background may be. The Lord Jesus Christ said, whoever comes to me, I will receive. You know, you can't come to him unless the Father has called you. If the Father has called you, then he's overruled all the mistakes of the past, all the sins of the past, and he calls you to come to the Lord Jesus where the forgiveness that Jesus procured on the cross is given to you, and you can come to him. 
And so, yes, you've got Ham, and yes, you've got his line. And is everybody ever born of Ham, ever saved? Well, it's not impossible that somebody could repent and could come to the Lord God and be incorporated into his people. Yes, you've got Shem and you've got his line, who are a godly line and from whom eventually, eventually the Lord Jesus comes. But do they all say godly? Well, we know from the scriptures that it is most definitely not so. And very often the curses of God fall upon those who come from Shem as well. Our duty today is to say that I want to be like Noah, not when he's lying drunk in his tent, but when he stands before God, worshipping and reaching out to God, and God enters into a covenant with him. That's what we want to be. You want to be accepted by God. You've got to enter into a covenant with him, an agreement. Oh God, please be my God. God says, I want you to be my child, and I will be your God. And because I'm your God, you will live a good and a godly life, and you will not live a life that is filled with scandal and failure and sin. And so right at the end of the flood story, we have this rather decrepit story, this sad story, the story that is filled with sadness and with the failure of one of the sons. But nevertheless, Noah stands up and blesses the righteous and he curses the evil. Don't be amongst the evil. Be amongst the righteous. And come to the Lord Jesus Christ so that you can be amongst those who will be in heaven one day. And God bless you. Hope to see you next week.